No, I'm hitting record. <laughs> I hit record first. <laughs> okay, fine, but I hit it right after you. <laughs> I'm starting. This episode of Healing Together is brought to you by Let's Get Checked, the leading provider of at-home health tests. Want to better understand your hormone levels? With Let's Get Checked, you can do a simple at-home health test that will give you a complete picture of your hormonal health in five days. Hey, Nicholas, did you know that hormone imbalances can be indicated by common symptoms like fatigue, insomnia, weight gain, headaches, breast tenderness, or changes in blood pressure? And hormones are an important factor in a number of conditions, including polycystic ovary syndrome. Ooh, that doesn't sound good. Low ovarian reserve or ovarian failure. I haven't had those. And menopause or early menopause. Ooh, I think I'm getting close to that. No, you're definitely not getting that. <laughs> But look, hormone levels can also be implicated in thyroid issues, and those can affect both women and men. All right. So tell me, Deirdre, how does it work? Your test is delivered straight to your door. You just self-collect a blood sample from the tip of your finger Ouch. and mail it back with a prepaid label. You'll receive support and guidance from the Let's Get Checked medical team who are available 24-7 to offer you personalized advice. I'm feeling kind of left out of this ad. But for you people who aren't, this week... You can try an at-home test for 30% off using the discount code TOGETHER30. So go to letsgetchecked.com and enter TOGETHER30, all one word. Let's get checked. It's good to know. All right. What do you think? How do we do? I think we did okay. Can we start the podcast now? Yeah. Hit it. Welcome to Healing Together. I'm Deirdre Tomlinson. And I'm Nicholas Boileau. Today we're talking to Dr. Cynthia Lee, a functional medicine practitioner who chronicled her long, complex journey of illness and healing in her book, Brave New Medicine, published last year. And when Deirdre says long, she means long. Dr. Lee went through over a decade of struggle and questioning and eventually discovery and healing. Her journey involved everything from thyroid medications to acupuncture, from changes in diet to qigong. Our conversation also covers gene expression, what happens in the body during Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and how everyone benefits when caregivers take care of themselves. So without further delay, we hope you'll enjoy our conversation with Dr. Cynthia Lee. Okay. Deirdre and I are here with Dr. Cynthia Lee. Cynthia, welcome. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here with you. And I want to start us off with a little bit about you for those people who don't know you, maybe a little bit about your life and your journey and mostly your medical history, your medical story, high points and low points, if you can give us, give us a summary to bring us to today. I will try to be uh, succinct, but... Um... You know, I'll start with the present. I am um, a trained internist. Um, so internal medicine is really a specialty um, in conventional medicine that focuses on chronic diseases in adults. And, um, you know, I began my professional calling uh, as a public health doctor and thought that this would be my lifelong service, working with underserved, doing international aid work. And, um, you know, as, as life, as it often happens, life took me down this different path um, from what I had planned. And shortly after the birth of uh, my first child, I developed an autoimmune condition, postpartum thyroiditis, which is the postpartum form of what's more commonly known as Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Um, and this is the most common form of hypothyroidism of underactive thyroid disease. I, I don't even know what the count is, uh, the latest count, but millions around the world uh, have it. And so I suddenly found myself on the other side of the bedside uh, than what I was used to. And the experience as a patient of having what would then become a chronic condition was very humbling. And, you know, I did what, what a doctor would do. I sought out the top-notch experts. I live in the Bay Area, so I was really surrounded by incredible cutting edge uh, research and specialists. I took medications to help my symptoms, to uh, support my thyroid. And uh, after about a year's time, my numbers normalized from my blood work. Um, I still wasn't feeling well. And I mean, generally the, the top three symptoms were probably fatigue, 
uh, insomnia and palpitations. You know, life continued. I was living a full life. I was working. I was a mother, um, had a very, very active husband, traveled a lot, all the while not feeling super well, but very functional. And then it was a, a real pivotal event for me when my young daughter, my husband and I took a trip to Beijing and I had a, a very dramatic disturbance, as I call it, where I suddenly felt a lot of energy shooting through me and then suddenly draining through me and lost consciousness. And when I awoke in the emergency room in downtown Beijing, I, I woke to a body that I just didn't recognize. Um, I was, uh, this would be the beginning of a couple of very uh, significant paths in my life. First uh, was, this was the beginning of chronic fatigue syndrome and uh, dysautonomia, which is uh, a dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system that controls uh, vital bodily functions that we take for granted every day. You know, heart rate, blood pressure, body temperature, digestion. So it's constantly, finely tuning to our emotions, our, uh, the, the day of time, you know, all the activities that we're doing or the non-activities that we're doing. So this was in complete disarray. And it was also the beginning of my second pregnancy. So um, in short, what this meant was I was bed bound for about six months of that pregnancy, the first six months of that pregnancy, barely able to get out of bed um, for the, the remainder of it. And by some miracle, had a baby healthy baby who is probably to this day, the healthiest person in our family, the strongest person um, for sure. Uh, But, but really being housebound for two years and then largely housebound for about a decade. So this was uh, the beginning of what would take me into integrative medicine and functional medicine, which is related and connected to integrative medicine but really going deeper into the root causes of chronic conditions. You know, we can look at that in so many different ways, so many different scales um, from the individual, right? Like what are the root causes of my chronic inflammation and the chronic autoimmunity, but also to the family level, you know, are there dysfunctions, are there stresses, are there imbalances? And then also to the society and even global, right? We can really look at, for example, through this same model, uh, what's going on with the world today, with the economic imbalances, the climate change. Um, now we've got this pandemic going on. So what are really the root causes beyond you know, this single coronavirus that have contributed to this, this sort of global health crisis? So that's, you know, that kind of takes us up to date in terms of what I do. There's one other path, I guess, in my life which I I talk about a lot in my book or kind of even scratch the surface of in my book is um, this piece into intuition. And that word intuition has gotten so (laughs) overused that I, I don't prefer to use it, but we can definitely use it, you know, for the sake of communicating and talking about it. Um, But really this opening into mystery and what that means for me is opening into this other kind of knowing. So, you know, I've been very, very trained with my analytical mind, my left brain, with logic, with proof, with scientific proof. And, you know, my journey had both opened me to how porous scientific proof is, actually, what we really hinge uh, our, you know, big decisions on and what we call proof is actually quite porous. And then the other piece was simply, I went from conventional medicine, right, with conditions like chronic fatigue syndrome and dysautonomia having really no good solutions to integrative and functional medicine, you know, which we will explore more in depth, but, you know, from diet changes and how many different diets are there, from supplements, you know, what do you need, testing, um, what, what sorts of exercise or, or not do I do? All these different modalities, osteopathy and you know, acupuncture, um, different kinds of meditation practices. It was very overwhelming for me. So I was initially using, quote unquote, the intuitive path to, um, to help me 
hone in on what it was that I could choose uh, to do with more ease. So it was a very, again, it was still kind of leading with my rational mind in honing my intuition, which I had learned is a craft like music or art that any of us can, can really develop if we practice. You know, and I'm at a very different place now with that, which is a much, I think, a much longer conversation. But uh, I use now kind of intuition and the analytical mind as two eyes, right? We, we have two eyes to see deeper and more broadly. And so I, I experience sort of using these two different modalities of thinking to see more clearly what is true what is actually in front of me, whether it's with myself, with my family and friends, or with my patients. So I just want to acknowledge that that whole intuition piece might be making some folks roll their eyes or just straight up uncomfortable, but I do have a follow-up question for you about it. You describe being in a very different place with that now, but you also, when you introduced it, you described you called it a mystery. You're contrasting these two ways of seeing the world, a very conventional and traditional viewpoint with this unknown and mysterious way of seeing the world. As you've gotten deeper into intuition, does it still feel like a mystery? Have you lost that piece of it or does it still feel like that? It doesn't feel mysterious in the sense of like just altering my sense of reality, you know, I've kind of blown open <laughs> into this, this new reality, like, oh, and now it feels ordinary, but it feels mysterious in the same way quantum science is mysterious to me. You know, I don't understand how, if you go somewhere way out in the universe, that you will age at a different, you know, at a different pace than <laughs> if I am here. I don't understand how something has the potential to be both wave and particle, you know, or you can bilocate. Uh, I don't understand that. But at the same time, the more I experience it and, and how I have learned to really experience it directly is through a Qigong practice, which is a, a ancient meditation practice, but it's really, it's embodied consciousness practice. So it's really a place where mind, body, spirit are integrated. And through that, I experience what is called subtle energies. And this is, it's not something that's just uh, reserved for mystics or healers. But again, science has really measured this or said even indirectly that there are these energies that are so subtle, we can't even measure them but we only infer them, right, because of the other scientific proof that we know. So they must exist. So, yeah, I, I still like to try to understand it to the best of my ability, but I'm very humbled by what I don't understand and now understand the body as that vehicle for direct experience of things that are beyond my capacity to, to formulate with my mind. Yeah, to me, living with that humility and curiosity feels like a great way to approach the world, and you probably never stop learning that way. Perhaps moving towards things that we that we can measure scientifically, that we do know a little bit more about, or think we know more about, what is Hashimoto's thyroiditis at a clinical level? You mentioned there's just a ton of people who have this in today's world. What's happening in the body during Hashimoto's thyroiditis, just to give a little more explanation to our listeners about what's going on there. Yeah, there, the immune system is attacking the thyroid gland, which is a butterfly shaped gland that sits right here, just below what would you know be the Adam's apple. And this is a gland that uh, it's a, it's an endocrine gland, meaning it produces hormones, thyroid hormones, which, you know, usually we think of in terms of metabolism, uh, like if it's overactive, you know, you lose a lot of weight and you have a lot of energy. And when it's underactive, it's the opposite. You feel lethargic and cold and much more uh, readily put on weight. But, you know, and in terms of a cellular level, what metabolism is, is just the rate at which your cells are generating energy and also turning over. So we don't actually want to be overactive or underactive, right? I mean, health really 
fundamentally just means balance, balance within yourself, balance within your cells, and then on the macroscopic level, balance uh, with your environment. So things are out of balance. The immune system's out of balance. It's overly revved up, and it begins attacking the thyroid gland. How Hashimoto's differs from something like Graves' disease, which is also an autoimmune condition of the thyroid gland, is that it, uh, it causes this inflammation. And if you think of it like inflammation is fire, right? So it's just kind of burning things up. And then the, um, the thyroid hormones that have already been made and they're in storage in the gland, they just get released out. So there you suddenly, uh, in most women who have Hashimoto's or postpartum thyroiditis, they will um, be probably overactive for a while because you get this flood of released storage uh, hormones. And then as those get burned up, um, because the level is so high, it tells your brain, stop sending signals to produce more thyroid hormone. So then the thyroid gland shuts down um, you, and then you fall over time into underactive thyroid. And then at some point, your thyroid gland tries to balance itself out again. But if there's ongoing inflammation, it, you often need some kind of supplementation to just to keep uh, the hormone levels balanced. And if you're underactive, which would be hypothyroid, mm -hmm. that will result in some of the symptoms you discussed, like exhaustion and just a difficulty moving through your life. Is that right? Yeah. And I would say, you know, for, um, it depends on the chronicity, but overactive thyroid is exhausting too. They're exhaustion in very different ways. So hyperthyroid, if you can imagine like being really strung out on caffeine or Ritalin or some kind of upper day in, day out, you're not able to sleep. I mean, you might have more energy initially, but you, you feel really, really unwell. The, the hypothyroid, the underactive exhaustion is, yeah, more of a lethargy, like a heaviness. And there can be a sense of detachment or depression. It's kind of like one of them is really hot and the other one is really cold. And having experienced both uh, quite extremely, if I had to ch I wouldn't choose either one, but if I had to choose one, it would be underactive. Um, okay. The, the overactive one had such acute symptoms that were uh, caused a lot of anxiety. Yeah. One of the things you talk about in your book, Brave New Medicine, you actually walk readers through your sort of learn-as-you-go healing process. And one of the steps is change your thoughts, change your genes. And I'm curious what evidence we have for that statement. So speaking of things we know, in a way, it sounds a little bit like a placebo effect, right? We know we've seen evidence in, in I think, numerous studies that your attitude and your mental state actually do have an impact on medical outcomes, on health outcomes. But the thought of having an impact on your genes on your genetic material is kind of like, are you kidding? You know, like, that's impressive. And the implication could be, right, that if you do change your genes and have children in the future, that genetic material could then be passed on. But maybe I'm misinterpreting that, perhaps willfully, as someone who hasn't had kids yet. Tell us more about change your thoughts, change your genes. Yeah. So this is the science of epigenetics, which is, uh, first off, I just want to clarify, we're not actually changing the, uh, the template of the gene, right? You get what you get when you're born um, from each parent. What we're talking about is changing the way the genes are turned on and off. So gene expression, as opposed to gene information, content. You mentioned the placebo effect. The placebo effect is the best evidence or the, the the largest breadth of evidence that we have that this in fact exists. And so, and you also mentioned, you know, we know that if you can change some of your thoughts or some of your behaviors that it can impact your, you can change your health. Well, what it's doing, the reason it does that is it's acting at that level of the gene among other, there's other physiological impacts as well. But um, one large one is the area of what genes are turning on and turning off. So first off, 
there are not all genes are accessible to modification, right? Not all of them are. And then the other piece I just do want to mention about autoimmunity, whether it's Hashimoto's or chronic fatigue syndrome, dysautonomia, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, any of these autoimmune diseases, that there is a genetic predisposition as well, right? So when we look at the total sum of factors that are causing, quote, stress on an individual's body, that in those who have certain genes, it may sort of form or result in the autoimmune condition. So the placebo effect, we usually think of in terms of a negative, you know, oh, it's a placebo. And that's because the reason it's been used is in these large randomized controlled trials where we're looking at single drugs or single procedures, which often come with considerable risk, right? And that's why we need these large randomized controlled trials. The placebo effect, what they're looking at, right? And, it, it, and it's fairly consistent, around 5% or so of people consistently, and some up to 10%, who respond to a, a sugar pill, right? Not the actual drug, but a sugar pill. And so we throw that out because we say, okay, you know what? Nope, that's a confounding factor. And we're just going to look at, we're going to compare people from this control group who got the placebo, the, the sham drug versus those uh, who are taking the actual drug. But what that, what that placebo cohort, cohort is actually showing is that the mind can influence the body and really at the level of gene expression. So one example is giving a placebo drug, right, a sham drug, to uh, people with, with pain. And it has been shown that, okay, so in this, in this cohort who actually experience pain relief, that if they are given naloxone, which is a drug that inhibits the opioid receptor, that they, their pain comes back, right? So what had happened was that their certain genes had turned on because of their thought that they were receiving a painkiller. And then the body begins to produce its own painkillers. And then you give the blocking drug and then suddenly their pain comes back. So that's an example. There's also been examples of like meditation leading to decreased lactic acid production. Uh, Robert Sapolsky's work, he's a stress physiologist at Stanford has done a ton of work on cortisol levels and thoughts and relaxation techniques, decreasing cortisol. So these are all measurable changes. And the reason that these things happen is because the expression of certain uh, genes that are connected to certain enzymes uh, or pathways in the body are being turned on and off. So at the same time, you've got a turning off of inflammatory pathways as well. So in a way, it's really use your thoughts, use your genes. Right. Or it's like activating. I, you know, I, I like the term activate. So you're, you're activating different patterns. And at the same time, what you're doing is breaking a conscious or subconscious patterns that have been really unhealthy. Right. So for myself, it was like, oh, I didn't realize that I was in this perpetual pattern of trauma. Because I, I felt, you know, I felt fine, but a lot of this got sort of buried subconsciously, or maybe it was a survival mechanism when I was a kid. But it's been something that's been habituated over time, and um, I didn't even know that was happening. You know, and I and I want to just caution: this is really different than positive thinking. Positive thinking is something that can further. Sometimes it depends on the person. Uh, for me, because my mind and my body were so separate that if I tried positive thinking, which I could never really do anyways, it sort of further separated the divide between my mind and my body. And I would suppress more in my body. Like you just got to get your way out of it. You got to think your way out of this. And I couldn't do it. So for me, it was really about going into the body, going into these regular habitual practices like Qigong every day, or, you know, there's more scientific ways too. There's vagus nerve stimulation practices where you can just begin to do that. And you begin to awaken your body really organically. And then for me, the body actually changed the way that my thoughts were. And so it became this really beautiful feed forward cycle of healing rather than trauma. If you're willing, 
let's talk a little bit about culture and what role culture can play in health. You mentioned trauma in your childhood and the stress of your childhood. And you also talk in your book about the stress of medical school itself and the process of going through that. Do you see, it, it, sounds, it sounds like you imply in your book that all of that stress really added up to an autoimmune condition that taken together, all these stressors added up to that for you and for your body. And I'm wondering if there's a cultural element there and what role culture plays, whether it's the culture you're brought up in, what you're sort of willing to understand and know about yourself, what you're willing to be present with, what you're able to handle in terms of stress, what your family's willing to talk about. What what role do you see culture playing in health and health outcomes? Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a huge piece. Um, and it's an important question because what really, I mean, what health and disease are is this, um, is this interface between the total sum environment, right, which culture plays a huge role, and then the self, the genes, uh, the constitution that you have. And so and the way, you know, in functional medicine, we really look at it is you're the tree, and then you've got all these inputs that are coming through these roots, right? And then depending on what's coming through and what that, that constitution and the genetic makeup of, of that tree is, you develop your branches and your leaves. And the health of that is really fed or nourished or even in some ways starved by whatever the, the total environment is providing in terms of nutrients, in terms of energy. And so culture is, um, I guess, you know, is, is, a, is, a, is a sum of the way in which we are encouraged uh, overtly or, you know, or subtly to manage, for lack of a better word, but manage our emotions manage our relationships and to also interpret, right? Interpret experiences that are happening. For me, I mean, I can speak for myself, right? I mean, I grew up as a uh, first generation Chinese American to immigrant parents in the heartland of Texas, where there were, there were very few minorities at the time. I was also raised in an evangelical community and my parents were founding members of the church that we grew up in. So sort of this culture of a, you know, pastor's kid equivalent. And, you know, the culture was very differential to elders, um, for better and for worse, was uh, very indirect. Any emotion, any negative emotions uh, were thought to bring uh, shame and burdens to those that you really love, right? So it was really about just, keeping the peace, keeping to yourself. Um, and the other piece too, you know, my parents were, when they were very young, both of their families were fleeing wars and other atrocities um, from China. And they grew up in Taiwan Then they came to the States. So they were immigrants twice over, uh, had really endured a lot of um, displacement and trauma. So it was also a survivalist mentality that, you know, I had grown up in. So talk, uh, talk about stiff upper lip, right? Right, right. And, you know, and then I also, uh, my constitution is very sensitive. So it was like, I always felt like my sensitivity was the problem. And there, and then there's always this notion too, like, you know, I was very appreciative, very grateful for my family and for my parents and what they had mm -hmm. gone through. And my, my challenges, whether it was like feeling people were, uh, racist to me at school or um, feeling like I didn't fit in at church or I was afraid that I was going to go to hell. I mean, these, these, these challenges felt so small compared to what I knew they went through, you know? So then we begin this, uh, this internal comparison and, oh, you know, I, I just need to, I need to toughen up. I just need to be quiet, which, you know, it all, it, it doesn't all come from hate and violence and resentment, it really comes from love. So um, that was the piece that I felt like as an adult, right, facing uh, the challenges that I had with my health was 
Well, I need to go a lot deeper than just taking a thyroid supplement to uh, correct this. And what are the ways in which I have suppressed all this stuff into my body? You know, because by the time I had developed my conditions, I, I was in a really good place emotionally. I was, you know, married to the love of my life. We had beautiful kids and uh, I had a great relationship with my parents, a very healed relationship with my siblings. So in my mind and in my emotions, I felt very clear. I just didn't realize how much had gotten suppressed down into the body. Can you talk a little bit about, I'm just curious about the medical training, and then we're going to move towards some more you know, practical applications of functional medicine and, and some of what you, you are working on. But I, I remember dating a medical student, and just as an anecdote, she went in one day and they did breast and testicular exams. And they made the students examine each other, which I thought was outrageous, an outrageous amount of pressure. You yeah. know, that suddenly you have to give your classmate a testicular exam and they have to give you a breast exam. It felt like an old boys club. Yeah. You know, and it's a, a rite of passage. And I'm wondering if when you talk about culture and the pressures of culture, if medical school had its own culture that wasn't sensitive to the individual needs of the students or, you know, someone like you who, who may have incredible sensitivities that can be used for your practice, but somehow gets put into a box that's the same for all the students. And that box is a bit of an old boys club. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's an old, old boys club. It's changing uh, slowly. But it's also, you know, it's also like military boot camp. So the culture there, and I would say this is, I don't think it's just for medical training. And I think it's a culture wide phenomenon uh, here is that implicit, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So really just pushing yourself to the limit, whether it's what you, you do with your work, with your family, really others first, despite how individualistic we are in this culture. It's still seen as self-indulgent or, uh, or self-gratifying uh, to care for yourself first and also kind of wimpy, like wellness and sleep and, you know, <laughs> eating well. I mean, it's just like, oh, who has time for that? But also it's wimpy, you know? So the tough succeed. And the, the culture in medicine is really for acute care, even today in the vast majority of medical centers. It's for acute inpatient care. So when I had left that culture to, to do outpatient medicine, I was when I first finished residency, I was doing outpatient medicine together with hospital medicine. And I didn't know, I didn't know the first thing about meeting patients like in their lives as they were, you know, they just came out, came off the streets from work or their house. I didn't, I didn't know how to do that. And so what I was trying to do was acute care management of chronic conditions. And it just doesn't, it doesn't work. Uh, or I'll say it doesn't work well. And the other piece for me during medical school also was, um, was just the grief, was the tremendous amount of life death situations that we're facing with our patients day in, day out. And we have no real mentorship in that. And it's at such a pace that we don't have a chance to process, much less release what's going on. You know, so and so I, you're I, getting a stiff upper lip, not just from your family culture and your, your faith culture, but also your, your medical culture, right? You're just not being taught how to feel and express and be a, an emotional being. And then it sounds like that's manifesting or that's exacerbated by a medical culture that doesn't prepare you for being with people who are in pain. Exactly. And, you know, and some of it is a tough upper lip um, mentality. And some of it is just simply the rat race. Like, like those things actually take time, you know? And that's what I learned really early on when I was a kid was, oh my God, my sensitivities are really, they're just getting in the way. I want to be productive. I want to be active. Um, I want to live lightly. Um, so those things I, I can just push to the side. And so it's the same thing, but sort of on steroids when you're in medical training. 
Speaking of sensations, let's talk about acupuncture. You describe also in your book, you describe the experience of going to receive acupuncture. And it's certainly more common in the United States than it's been in the past, but I would bet most people have not had it. And I'm wondering if you can describe what it's like to be treated with acupuncture. What's the sensation? What are the thoughts going through your head? Is it strange? Is it strangely normal? It's strangely normal now. It was very strange um, at the time. And so acupuncture uses needles and they're, they're very, very fine needles. It's not like, you know, the 18 gauge needles <laughs> when you go to the hospital for shots or, um, you know, or. Are they the, painful? Um, they're, well, they're not, the needles themselves are not painful. They're literally like, they're, they're wispy almost, you know, they're, they're flexible. And so the point is very, very small. Sometimes I don't even feel the needle going in. But what, what some people might call painful is if the, um, the tip of the needle hits a particular meridian. So they, um, the way traditional Chinese medicine works is uh, meridians, is uh, these energy channels that are not, not really correlated with what we know anatomically, like what we in Western medicine would, you know, correlate with anatomically. But what's fascinating is the more I go into it, it has something to do with embryological development. So like if they do something like a, a, stu- a quote stomach point on the leg, that there's probably some embryological correlation with that. And so it's fascinating to me. Again, it feels a little bit like neuroscience kind of supporting and proving what we what mystics have known all along through these ancient healing practices this feels like you know at the more we go deeper into science we're actually revealing and explaining what acupuncture is doing so yeah like i mean the first time i went in my acupuncturist only put in two needles and i was actually hoping for more right i was like i want you know i want faster relief and he was like, oh, you know what? The way this works with the subtle energies is like less is more, <laughs> you know? And uh, he inserted them in my, in my hands and I had a mass. And I felt very, very uh, relaxed. So I fell into a very deep sleep after years of insomnia. You slept right there? Right there or did yeah, you... on the treatment table, yeah. With the needles in your body? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it feels, you know, like I think, you know, part of uh, a lot of what it's doing is uh, autonomic nervous system rebalancing. So shifting you out of the fight or flight stress state out into the relaxation state, which is where healing happens. You can't heal when you're trying to survive. So survival and healing are very opposite uh, states that the body's trying to balance. And I felt, yeah, I felt tingling in my arms. And then I just drifted off and I was a little bit in, yeah, kind of an altered state when I woke up. Um, but it's not always like that, you know, it's um, sometimes I would go in and I would feel nothing. I mean, in terms of my direct physiological experience. And then other times I'd have really severe withdrawal reactions several hours later. So it really, it's very individual. And I would say for acupuncture, as well as any other modality, even like, you know, a lot of people are like, well, are there other functional medicine doctors, you know, that are uh, in whatever, Canada or wherever they are, we get very attached to whatever that modality is. Like that's the thing that's going to you know, help me or save me. And it's the resonance with the practitioner, I cannot underscore more. So I'll often tell people, you know what? Actually, I don't know if it matters so much if you are going to pursue cranial osteopathy or acupuncture, make sure the fit is right and just follow that. So that's still a huge piece of, of the healing puzzle. And, you know, the, the acupuncturist that I wrote about in my book, uh, Robert Levine, he was the fifth acupuncturist that I had tried. And they were all very high level, highly you know, recommended practitioners. And I was basically about to give up and just thought that modality doesn't work for me, or I'm not open to it or whatever it is. But he was the last one. And are, I don't know, we connected on on a different level. Can you talk about that fit a little bit more? What that feels like? 
or should feel like from the patient perspective or from the practitioner perspective? Yeah, I mean, there, so there are things like surgeries, for example, right? Where I would just say, you know what? Skill matters probably more than anything. If you don't connect to the particular surgeon or maybe it's an integrative modality, you know, like some kind of, or, you know, you're getting an IV infusion of vitamin C or, you know, some other cocktail. And if it's a skill-related um, treatment or healing modality, you know what, just go, go with that. Don't compromise that if you, if you don't have to, if you have the option, right? If you have the luxury to really seek out uh, that doctor or that practitioner. But in terms of more, again, more longitudinal, longer term healing, the fit is, yeah, it's incredibly important. It matters uh, again, and part of this is is the thought piece, is the epigenetic piece, right? It matters if you feel love and true concern coming from your practitioner. And it probably opens our, us up to treatments that otherwise uh, we might not be open to. It's, yeah, it's like any other partner in any kind of endeavor, right? I mean, you two have partnered on this for a particular reason. I mean, you have a shared goal, but there's, there's a certain resonance. And, and then when there's resonance, I mean, there's ease. And again, that's just healing. When there's not, there's always a little bit of that resistance. And where I feel challenged just in, in my own life, in whether it's colleagues that I work with, whether it's my own healers or teachers that I have, is when there's a dissonance, right? Between that and like, I want to learn that skill. I want to receive that healing. And yet there's something there relationally that is challenging. And is that something for me to just continue to work through? In some cases it is. In some cases, is it for me that I'm just, you know, where I'm onto the next phase or they're onto the next thing. And is it time to say, uh, you know, to go different, different paths. So each one really has to be weighed differently. I really appreciate that. And I'm noticing that we're kind of pushing your time a little bit. So I'm wondering if you have time for a couple of extra questions. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I'm uh, reading your book. I found myself sometimes putting myself in your husband's shoes and getting really impatient with the journey you were going through of illness and struggle with just the basic tasks of living. You know, and I, I remember vividly wondering if I would have stuck it out and wondering, you know, when at one point I would have exploded and I, I would have just said, you know, get yourself out of bed and do the things you need to do in this partnership. It's driving me nuts. And later I started really wondering how many people are out there really suffering with illnesses that aren't visible or aren't definable in an accepted taxonomy of illnesses where, you know, the minute you tell someone I have cancer, the compassion meter shoots up. But there are many illnesses out there where people are really suffering and other people are having trouble having compassion for them. Is there any advice you could give someone who is suffering with what I might, for lack of a better word, I might call it an invisible illness or a non-accepted as an illness illness that can help them communicate or deal with a world that is impatient and doesn't understand and may be callous to what they're going through? Absolutely. No, it's a huge challenge. And, you know, illness does not happen in isolation and healing doesn't happen in isolation either. So um, it was, I mean, so many times, right? I mean, how many times through, uh, through those of us who are going through it is like, oh, I'm a burden. You know, I'm a burden. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to do this or put it on him or my kids or, you know, whoever else. That's a, that's a really big piece. I think what, um, first off, I was, I mean, to have David as my partner was, uh, you know, I wrote about the challenges 
what was re- very challenging for me. And yet I, there were things I just, I knew uh, that I was, that I wasn't dealing with, you know, that so many other people deal with. And I hear it from my patients all the time. Like, first off, they don't even believe that this is like, quote, real, which sort of perpetuates the trauma, right? It's this invisibility, right, but it's right. also like this need for validation. So we're kind of almost like willing for it to be real because it is real and like, hey, I'm really suffering. The other piece about the, this not being real or there's nothing tangible to hang our hats on is we don't know what the prognosis is. I mean, we really don't know. And that in and of itself is a, very, is a great challenge. And so for me, I just went, you know, I'm going to live every day. You know, this is a new day. This is a new day. And be in the present. And it would, it would help me not get into despair. Like, oh, my God, it's been, you know, 10 freaking years. But for my husband, his coping strategy was opposite, right? He was like, look forward, look forward, look forward. And like, what do you want to be doing, you know, when you're better? And what do you want to be? I just be like, oh my God, like, don't take me there. You know, I'm going to get really depressed. So first off, I would say what was tremendously helpful for us, something that I, I alluded to, but per- perhaps didn't fully uh, develop in my book was the support system we had. So it was really like, it became less about you're doing this to me and you're doing this to me. And you know what, let's just c- create some space. We're both really struggling to survive. And we just started leaning, not leaning, but like really um, confiding and uh, connecting with people outside of our marriage. So that we had more space. And then I could see, oh my God, he's not doing that to me. He's not trying to create stress for me. He's just trying to survive. You know, so first off is really, however it is just to release judgment to release judgment. And often any kind of judgment I had on him, I would say, God, I'm, if that's my judgment on him, I don't even want to know what my own judgment on myself is. Right. Like get the hell better. What the hell is wrong with you? And not only that, you're a doctor, like get, you know, get with the program. So the community piece is huge. And, you know, I even find myself actually just last week, this, uh, this friend of ours, who's 20 years old, uh, who's in a long-term relationship, we just started asking me questions like, how do you, how do you know the person's the one, you know, how do you know? And I love that that's where she was in her life. And I thought, how fun, you know? And I said, you know what? I, I don't actually believe that there's one true person. Like I think that you could have a few or several, you know, potential partners, but the, you're also marrying a community. And the community, like, look at, you know, look at his or her friends, the family, because that's who's going to be supporting you guys when you're really facing some challenges, you know, and, and, and when you're um, experiencing tremendous joy, right? That's, that's kind of the glue. So much pressure now is on the nuclear family and just the, the partnership. And so how do we create space for each other? And trust, you know, you're speaking of trust. How do we trust that we can somehow stay connected, you know, when we're separate? And then what was the, what was the other piece of your question? I'm so enthralled with your story and what you're saying that I forgot. <laughs> I'm, I, I, yeah. I love what you're saying about, you said not leaning on, but incorporating your community into your life more and, you know, being able to turn to others. And it sounds like that also allows you to let out some of the pressure that builds up in a nuclear family yes, in a really healthy way and, and get some of the, the love and the support that one often tries to get just at home, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's, that's pressure. No one should have to take in the home. You know? And same with the kids. People are like, how did you even manage? You know, part of it was that I could do most of the basic stuff at home uh, for the kids, right? And, and for myself. Uh, but there were times when I was afraid to be alone with the kid. I mean, it was that brittle. And that's when, you know what, we would even, David and I had moved um, right, like sort of at the height of my health crisis. And um, 
I, I was I was really afraid because we didn't know any of our neighbors. And uh, but you know what? We reached out. Like if David was going to go out of town, I was like, okay, I don't even know Elizabeth, but Elizabeth is going to be there for me if I need someone. You know, I mean, it was incredible. So it felt old fashioned in that way. If I need an egg, I don't need to go to the store and just waste all my energy on that. I can just ask my next door neighbor, Jillian, you know, hey, do you have an egg I can use? And so, um, and same with the kids. People really stepped in, but a lot of it was us learning how to reach out. Um, so the kids really grew up with multiple parental figures. And on the other piece, just about the partner, I would say, or, or any beloved, you know, who's watching and trying to support as best they can this other person who's who's uh you know really in a health crisis is um i mean it sounds cliche but you really have to take care of yourself first and i I think that not a lot of not enough focus is actually on the caretaker is on the partner that's really interesting cynthia because that brings us back to now i'm remembering the genesis of the question which was really what do you do when you have that invisible illness and A, no one's believing you necessarily as much as you should be believed, but B, it's taxing the system. And I think what you just said is also encourage your caretaker to, or the people around you to be generous to themselves and to take care of themselves. And that probably pays off because then they have more energy for you as the person struggling through a health crisis. Absolutely. And, you know, that's one thing David was really good at. David was really good about doing the things that nourished him. You know, and I remember at the time, I'm like, what? You're going to play basketball? You know, I mean, for me, I was just like, he's going off to play and he's in denial. And, you know, he plays basketball all the time. But you know what? He was really doing it to survive, right? And to take care of himself and to release, you know, stress. So that pleasure is, is absolutely necessary. It's not selfish and it's not an extra. But you have to practice it every day, especially if you're the caretaker. You know, it's funny because you're, you're talking about stuff that to me is reflective of a lot of ancient wisdom. I mean, even in the loving kindness meditation, you start with yourself. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of philosophy around when you, when you are in your best shape, you're relieving the world of someone who's angry or someone who's who's hurtful. So when you encourage your caretaker to be in their best shape possible and mm-hmm. mentally and physically, they're going to be just in a better place to help you inevitably, right? Right, absolutely. I mean, I think the challenge though is that it's still, there's so, still so much pressure on the individual for self-care. What I'm really hoping for and pushing for, you know, and working at larger levels is, how do we create communities where that's built in, where it's not like, oh, you need to do this and you need to do that. And just, okay, you know what? Like if that's not working, then here's one more thing to do. Healing is very different than treating, right? So treating is something that happens unilaterally and, um, and often quite quickly. And it's something that we can often fold into our lives. And healing is really about deep change. Like whatever you've been doing has not been working for your body or your mind or your, or your heart, your emotions. And so it really requires us to pause and to make really big changes. One way to do that actually as the caretaker and even to change the dynamic within the nuclear family is to, you know, to, to seek people and resources outside of the family, right? It changes that dynamic. It's all of a sudden not just the four of you or the two of you or the one of you. And that's huge in terms of shifting old patterns. And so I, you know, I see a lot of patients still, and I've been doing this kind of medicine now for almost 10 years. And I now start it very differently than I used to, because what I've seen over time is that Functional and integrative medicine is great. I mean, we can talk about different diets, right? We can change your diet if, if the other diet, if you're now changed and healed, or maybe your condition's changed and it's worsened, but we'll change the diet to adjust to what you need right now. 
We'll tweak your supplements, maybe your hormones need some balancing. We'll look for, you know, infections. There's so many different things we can do. But there are a lot of people then that gets, they're still stuck, right? They're still in this chronic pattern over years. And what I've realized is that integrative functional medicine can be a very sophisticated tool to help us cope with what we have, but we're just maintaining an ability to function. There's not really deeper healing happening. And, you know, again, it's not, it's not even a judgment. It's an open-ended question with my patients. What is it that you really want? And sometimes their lives are such that they really cannot do a lot of changes, right? They're a single parent, you know, working two jobs, barely making rent. I mean, it's, it's very, very challenging. But even so, I'll ask them, what is one area that you can let go of that needs to change? And it doesn't cost any money. It just costs some commitment and some courage to let that piece go. But really, if deep change is what someone wants, then are they willing to, are they ready to make some really big changes in their lives? Yeah, I love that question. What do you want? And it's reflective of what BJ Miller said when we spoke with him about what he asked patients who are facing some end of life issues, you know, what do you want now? Yes. Um, and then helping them see if they can actually actualize some of those things. I would love to, I mean, I'd love for us to ask that when we're not facing death. Yes. I mean, imminent death that we know of. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's very similar to smokers who say, you know, oh, I mean, of course I want to quit. Well, but are you ready to do it? And if you're not, it's okay. But just acknowledging that so that we're conscious of the choices we're making every day, which is a big part of connecting to our bodies. There's already healing just in that, just in saying, I want to heal, but I am not ready to make those changes. There's a lot of forgiveness in that, and there's a lot of just truth in that. It's beautiful. To bring us to the end of this conversation, which I don't want to end, but I am mindful of your time. The last pages of your book, which uh, we'll put in the podcast notes, and we're, it's just a litany of fantastic advice and recommendations and they they span from you know qigong to dietary practices i was reading through them and i got totally overwhelmed i did not have that experience i was happy for the list i wanted i wanted the two things i can do today so i was thinking I'll just pick one i'll make your life really simple <laughs> so no i totally i totally um agree uh it's overwhelming you know, which is why I ended up going into deep into intuition too, right? I was overwhelmed. And it's funny because that, that section, I get more feedback on <laughs> than anything else. Like some people are like, well, you know what? I'm just going to rate it a four because, you know, I wanted recipes in there and you didn't have recipes in there. <laughs> oh my goodness. You know, this actually was really a memoir. I wasn't even intending on having the how-to section in there. until so, A, my publishers really encouraged me to do it. And secondly, I realized, oh, you know what? Yeah, most people who are going to be reading this are, are not just reading it for a medical memoir where I was trying to show through my journey how to heal, right? I didn't want to really have to list it out explicitly. And then I realized, you know what? As patients reading this, like, it could be really helpful, right? Just to give them a place to start. Part of my reluctance was that there's so much information. I didn't know what to include in that that part. And yeah, that must have been really difficult. Yeah, what diet do I put in there? I mean, I only got like whatever, 50 pages or whatever it was. But that said, I would, um, again, I've been doing this long enough to where, uh, and also I should just say like through my own journey, I've learned as well that integrative medicine, I mean, I kind of see it as these, like this bicycle wheel, right? With all these different spokes. And so the more, right, sort of spokes you can do like the more complete the wheel of healing, but it is, it's very exhausting. So either a, we completely, completely change our lives or B, we can go a little bit more simply, which is the difference between integrative medicine and integrated medicine. And I've also heard it since, since then I've heard it called integral medicine as well. So this 
this Qigong practice that I've been doing, right, which is really mind, body, spirit, but it's integrated. All three of those elements are integrated together into the practice and through repetition. So whether it's, we're also doing a lot of different things through this practice. We're changing our thoughts and changing our genes, right? We're also uh, breaking old habits and letting go of habits that don't serve us. We're creating community, whether it's through a Qigong group and whether it's a virtual community, whether it's the energy field that we're connecting to, you know, we're connecting to our ancestors and to other masters and the whole bit. So there's all these different ways in which we are, those, those different steps, those 15 steps are integrated into this one practice. And you're getting your daily dose of nature too, if you do it outside. Exactly. So I do it outside. Yep, exactly. And then uh, nourish yourself, right? So food is energy. I mean, that, that's really what it is. And we're trying to maximize the energy that we can absorb and incorporate into ourselves to maximize energy, which is healing, right? Health is energy, and healthy energy, balanced energy that's flowing. It's not stuck somewhere. So Qigong is the cultivation of energy. And what I found also is that the more I have energy, the more I actually need to eat right? Because not only is my digestion stronger and I'm, I'm absorbing more of what it is that I'm eating, but I actually need less because I'm literally absorbing it from my environment. So it's a daily practice. It's daily, 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 daily. And so it begins to change things that you don't even know were there. And a lot of them were childhood established energetic patterns, patterns of how you're your neurons are wired to the genetic changes to uh, hormones, changes in hormones. So I also warn people, like, be careful what you wish for, uh, you know, because <laughs> healing, and this is where we connect to what it is that you want. What do you want? It's easy to say, I don't want pain. I don't want uh, weight gain. I don't want depression. I don't want these things. but it's, it's scary in some ways to acknowledge what it is that we want. And then to suddenly be in a place where you can receive what you want, and then now you're called to do it, is, is a whole different journey. And so I, I, I do say that to people. Well, be careful what it is that you want. Because when you get it, and you will get it, you know, you've got some work to do. Well, that's a beautiful, beautiful place to end. Just to repeat what you said. I think the one thing is the Qigong practice. Did I get that right? Yeah. Or, I mean, for me, that was my path, but there are, that was other, your one thing. there are other embodied consciousness practices. And I have some patients where the spiritual stuff is a little bit far out for them and they've been doing neuroplasticity. Uh, there's neural retraining, you know, which is much more science-based. There's also, some people have found this through tapping EFT, which is a technique so it's, it really goes back to connecting to yourself. Yeah. You have to, the only way you can heal is, is if you connect to yourself and to connect to your body. Well, I have done the practice that you recommend. You, there's a video you point yeah. to in some of your posts. And I believe in the short book you published on how to sort of bolster your inner shield during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I've done that video. And there's a moment at the end where... Is his name Master? Is it who? Oh, Ming Tong Gu. Mm -hmm. Ming Tong Gu. Yeah. He he makes the sound at, right at the end. He's smiling and he goes "hawa hawa," and he is exuding positive energy and happiness and just centeredness. It's just an amazing, like from the depth of yeah. his being, this beautiful sound coming up of just appreciation, or at least that's what it is to me. Uh, if if there's a different interpretation, tell me, but that's how I heard it. Yeah. So, I mean, hala is hala in Mandarin. Hala. Hao means well. La is an interesting modifier. It's past tense, as if to say, all is well already. So when you have that phrase, it's present, past, and future. And you can use it just sort of like, hey, all is well, right? You're doing a practice, all is well, all is well. And again, not in terms of positive thinking, but in terms of connecting to the wholeness 
and connecting to that place of potential energy that is informing everything, right? And if you want to think about something tangible, connecting to that, that stem cell that is yet to sort of become its full potential and everything as well. But that, that stem cell is part of you as well. But then also it can be a command, like how lot, like all is well, like, you know, it all is well, you know, it's like, amen, right? Amen. So you're, you're harnessing this life energy and harnessing that almost as a command, like all is well already. And the other beautiful piece about how is that the character is the way it's written in Mandarin is, or in Chinese, in all the dialects is um, the feminine, the mother feminine character with the child. So really that completion, that nourishment, that love, that wholeness is what is good. So there's a lot there. <laughs> well, this, this falls into what is good. It's been really, really a pleasure. Thank you so much for making the time for us. To talk with you both. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for what you're doing. I think it's, it's incredible to, uh, to create this space for people. Thanks, Cynthia. Healing Together is produced by Healthinly. Our theme song is Ramble, composed and performed by Ed Morneau. 